turned in bed and glanced at the clock, groaning softly to see it was nearly one in the morning. My wife, Alina, slept fitfully next to me. But I couldn't stop thinking about the strange things that had been happening since we adopted a nine-year-old boy named Jude. Turning onto my back and sighing, I wished for sleep to come. A shout came out from in the hall, followed quickly by a series of thumps. I sat up in bed, and Alina propped herself up. What was that? She asked. I think it was your mom, I said, implications dawning on me. Her mother had just arrived that afternoon to stay with us for over a week. We threw the covers off and rushed out of the room. I flipped on the hallway light at the top of the stairs, and we looked down to see Jeannie lying at the bottom of the staircase. She cried out in pain, and I could tell that at least one of her arms was broken. Jesus Christ! Mom! Alina cried, running down the stairs. I went and got my phone, calling 911. While I was still on with the operator, I moved down to try and comfort Jeannie while the ambulance came. Gasping in pain, she gestured for us to get closer. When she did, she whispered, He pushed me. I was going to get a drink of water, and I felt him push me. All three of us looked up at the staircase to see Jude standing there, peering down with wide eyes. Jude looked around the living room, green eyes big and reflecting the sunlight from the windows. He clutched a Batman action figure in one hand. I'd never seen him without it during the whole adoption process. My wife Alina and I stood nearby, smiling, giving the nine-year-old some time to get used to the space. This was his first time in our home, after all, his new home. We'd only ever met at the adoption place for supervised meetings to make sure we were a good fit for each other. Glancing up at Alina, I saw the joy in her face at having a child in the house. I stepped over and wrapped an arm around her shoulders. She looked up into my face, eyes watery with forming tears. She put an arm around my waist and we watched as the small for his age child walked over to the couch and sat down. He looked up at the television on the wall. From what we knew about his history, he likely never had access to a big screen TV or a video game system like the one I played to wind down from work. But we had to be careful about limiting his screen time. From all the reading we'd done, mostly Alina, we knew that these several first months would be hard on all of us. Adopting a child wasn't something to be taken lightly, but I was confident it would come to be a rewarding and fulfilling experience. And the look on my wife's face was a great start. We'd managed to have a child during the first year of our marriage, but the unthinkable happened. When our son was six months old, he died in his crib. I was dragged from sleep one morning when I heard Alina screaming in our room. I jumped out of bed, fearing the worst, as I saw Alina next to the crib in the corner of our bedroom. And when I saw the limp infant clutched to her chest, those fears came true. After an investigation, the cause of death was ruled a sudden infant death syndrome. Of course, we'd heard of SIDS, but we never thought it would happen to us. We had no risk factors usually associated with SIDS. But still, our son, Adriel, was ripped away from us. And for all our modern science and healthcare, no one could tell us why the child had died. Saying it was SIDS was like saying there was no cause that they could find. The death tested our marriage. It bent, but it never broke. And after five years, we felt some semblance of normalcy. We started discussing the possibility of trying again. But Alina became fixated on the fact that SIDS was more likely to happen to a subsequent child if it had already happened. She came to think that her womb was cursed and that any child she brought into the world would die before it reached its first birthday. So we looked to adoption and eventually we found Jude. We considered adopting a baby, but Alina was against it. So we settled on adopting an older child and eventually we found Jude. He seemed like a sweet and shy kid on all our visits with him. He had a tough life, as did most foster kids. His mother died giving birth to him, leaving him with only his older brother and abusive father. 
After the older brother had been seen at school with bruises and scars on his arms, Child Protective Services was called. And it didn't take them long to see that both boys were being beaten regularly by their father. When it was clear that they would be taken into foster care, the older boy disappeared. There was some question as to whether the father had killed him or he'd just run away. There was no solid evidence for either explanation. All we knew was that he hadn't been heard from in the year that Jude had been in foster care. When we got to know him as much as we could, Alina and I were confident we could provide Jude with a loving, nurturing home and a good life. On that first day when we brought him home, I knew it would be a tough adjustment for all three of us. But I had no idea how bad things would really get. Nico! Alina's shout from the backyard caught my attention. I was trying to get Jude to eat what we heard was his favorite breakfast food, eggs with hash browns and ketchup. Leaving Jude sitting at the table with his mouth firmly shut, I moved out the back door to where Alina was standing with her coffee in one hand and the garden hose in the other. It was her habit to come out into the backyard every morning to water the little garden we had growing. But as I padded over into the grass, I saw what had prompted her to shout at me like she did. It was an animal, a rabbit. Our yard backed up to a lush green belt, so rabbits were a common sighting in our neighborhood. And given that our fence was a bit old and in need of repair in several places, we often saw them in our yard. But we'd never seen one like this. The rabbit was dead. Its head had been smashed, and the implement that had done the smashing lay discarded nearby. Alina pointed at the shovel. Did you leave this here? It took me a moment to unwrap what she was really saying, and it surprised me. Are you asking me if I killed that rabbit with the shovel? Alina paused. No, of course not. We both peered over our shoulders to see Jude standing in the doorway, clutching his Batman action figure in his left hand. He stared at us with a blank look on his face. You don't think, I began. No, Alina breathed. No way. What we didn't say aloud was that there wasn't any other logical explanation. We chose to ignore it, burying the incident along with the rabbit. Alina gently questioned Jude about whether he'd been outside during the night, unwilling to ask him outright if he'd killed the animal. He simply shook his head. We believed him. We wanted to believe him so badly but that was only the start of the trouble. It got worse, much worse. We adopted June at the beginning of summer, so there was no school. Alina worked from home as a product manager for a large tech company, but knowing that we would be adopting, she saved up vacation days so she could give him her full attention for the first month he was with us. Then it would be my turn to take a month off afterwards. So two weeks after we brought Jude home, Alina was still the one at home with him all day while I was at work. When I was pulling into our neighborhood just before four on a Friday afternoon, I saw Alina at the corner of our street, looking around frantically. Fear blooming in my chest, I pulled over and rolled down the window. She looked in at me, her terrified face wet with tears. He's gone, she said. I went to the bathroom for five minutes, and when I came out, he was just gone. When? I asked. Did this just happen? Alina nodded. I just ran out here. I've been calling for him, but he hasn't answered. Okay, get in. We'll drive around and find him. He must be here somewhere. Alina got inside the car, and we drove down our street, windows down, shouting his name. Maybe he's back in the green belt, I said. There was a paved path, through the several mile stretch of Greenbelt directly behind our house. About 200 yards down the street from our house, there was a Greenbelt entrance, a sidewalk that ran between two houses to get to the stretch of public land. As we pulled up next to the entrance, we looked down to see a small gathering of people where the sidewalk met the paved pathway at a T. Thinking they'd found Jude, we both jumped out of the vehicle and ran toward them. There was a man and a woman in jogging clothes, along with a teenage boy with a skateboard under his arm. They were all looking down at something. 
The trio looked up as we approached. Is this your dog? The man asked, gesturing at the black and brown Yorkshire Terrier lying in a puddle of blood on the paved pathway. My throat constricted as I remembered the rabbit in our backyard, and I thought about how animal cruelty was often a sign of deep-seated emotional trouble. I just shook my head. But Alina said, Have you seen a little boy? Sandy hair, green eyes, wearing a Batman t-shirt? The man and woman shook their heads. But the teenage boy just looked at us and then back at the dead dog. It was hard to tell through the fur, but it looked as though the animal had been stabbed to death. Alina moved past the group and started shouting for Jude on the green belt. Sorry, we're just trying to find our... I paused for some reason. Uh, son, our son. Then I moved in the opposite direction as Alina and I started shouting for Jude. Pretty soon, I came to the spot behind our house. Something occurred to me, and I pushed through the 15 yards or so of vegetation between our back fence and the pathway. At the fence, I stood on my toes and looked over into the yard. Jude was sitting on the back patio, playing with his action figure. Jude! I said. He looked up and said nothing. Stay right there, I said. Okay, Jude replied and went back to playing with his toy. I pulled my phone out and called Alina, telling her I'd found him. I said I would keep him in sight until she got the car and got back to the house. With that done, I started looking for a way over the fence. There was no gate at the back because the vegetation was so thick. It was too tall for me to jump, but many of the boards were warped and I found a couple next to each other that were loose enough for me to pull back and fit through, barely. Work clothes now dirty, I got through the fence and moved over to Jude. Where were you, buddy? I asked. Here, he said. Here in the backyard? Jude nodded. Okay, I said. Okay. I sat and studied him until Alina ran through the house and into the backyard, wrapping Jude in a hug. Oh my God, I thought I'd lost you. He says he was back here the whole time, I told her. Did you look back here? Of course I did, she said, stroking Jude's hair. Of course. Alina had left the back door open, and I heard our doorbell ring. Leaving Jude and Alina in the backyard, I moved through the house and opened the door. The teenage boy with the skateboard stood there. He had jet black hair and wore a ratty t-shirt and jeans. Yes, I said, realizing he must have followed Alina as she drove back. Is this about the dog? The kid glanced behind him at the street, then turned back to me. Yeah, he said. He seemed reluctant to tell me why he was standing on my front porch. I don't know who the dog belongs to. I'm sorry, I said. No, the kid said. He paused. Did you find your son? Yes, I said, unsure where this was going. Why? And he's wearing a Batman shirt? He has brown hair? Yes. Well, the thing is, see, I lived down the road in the cul-de-sac and I was just skating on the green belt and I saw a kid like you described. He was on the green belt and he was walking away from that dog. I mean, I didn't see the dog at first, but then I saw it and there was no one else around. The dog was still moving when I saw it. I just stared at him, remembering the rabbit once again. And, the kid said, I'm pretty sure I saw a knife in his hand. Like a kitchen knife. It's impossible, Alina said as we lay in bed that night. He's such a sweet boy. He couldn't do such a thing. Alina, we have to consider the possibility that it's his doing. I mean... How else would you explain the rabbit, let alone that poor dog? And why is there suddenly a knife missing from the kitchen? I couldn't find it anywhere. Honestly, we're lucky that kid was discreet about it. Otherwise, we might be dealing with a very angry dog owner right now, demanding answers we don't have. I just can't believe it. I can't. We need to keep a closer eye on him. I don't want to believe it either. But we have to take this seriously. My mother will be here tomorrow, Alina said. Should we tell her? I think so, 
I said. She'll be here for what, a week? Ten days, Alina said. She sounded on the verge of tears. We should definitely tell her. She can help observe his behavior while she's here. Alina nodded reluctantly. We both turned off our lights and tried to sleep. I stayed awake for a long time. When sleep was finally coming for me, I turned onto my side, facing the door. And I saw that the door had been opened about six inches. Through that gap, I could have sworn I saw Jude standing out in the dark hall, watching us sleep. I reached up and turned on the light. And when I looked back at the door, there was no one there. Getting up, I moved down the hall to Jude's room and peeked inside. He was in his bed, facing the wall. I went back to the room and shut the door and locked it. Alina's mother, Jeannie, showed up the next afternoon. She would be staying in the bedroom Alina normally used for her office. She doted on the boy at first, but later that evening, Alina took her aside and told her about our suspicions. After that, I could tell that Jeannie was a little distant in her interactions with the kid, even if she didn't really mean to be. We kept a close eye on the boy with Jeannie's help, and for about a week, nothing strange happened. Jude still wasn't opening up to us, and I wasn't sure he ever would. If there was something really wrong with him, I figured he wouldn't ever really become a true part of our family. And to be honest, I didn't want him in my family if he was going around killing animals. Despite all this, I still had hope that it was all some mix-up or a series of coincidences. But what happened next made me realize without a shadow of a doubt that something was truly wrong with Jude. As I was going to bed around 10 that night, I'd made sure everything downstairs was locked up tight before checking that Jude was still in bed. We'd tucked him in earlier, but I always checked to make sure he was still there before finally going to bed myself. Jeannie had gone to bed around nine right across the hall from Jude's room. For the first hour or so, the house was quiet. But around 11 o'clock, while my mind was still going around in circles about Jude, I started hearing low thumping sounds. I thought they were coming from the hall. I got up once to check and found Jude still in bed. Jeannie's door was still closed. So I went back into my room to try and get some sleep. It seemed like every time I approached the precipice of sleep, something brought me back out of it. I glanced at the clock, groaning softly to see it was nearly one in the morning. A shout came from out in the hall, followed quickly by a series of thumps. I sat up in bed and Alina propped herself up. What was that? She asked. I think it was your mom, I said. We threw the covers off and rushed out of the room. I flipped on the hallway light at the top of the stairs and we looked down to see Jeannie lying awkwardly at the bottom of the staircase. I went and got my phone, calling 911, while Alina went to help her mother. While I was still on the phone, I hurried down the stairs to try and comfort Jeannie while the ambulance came. We didn't want to move her, thinking we could hurt her even worse. Gasping in pain, she gestured for us to get closer. When we did, she whispered, He pushed me. I was going to get a drink of water, and I felt him push me. All three of us looked up at the staircase to see Jude standing there, peering down with wide eyes. I sat slumped on the couch in the living room, exhausted from the night's ordeal. Jude was watching cartoons on the television, smiling as if nothing was wrong. The frenetic visuals and keening sounds from the show drove like spikes into my temples. Alina had accompanied Jeannie to the hospital, riding in the ambulance. She called me about an hour ago, saying that her mother had broken an arm and a hip and cracked a couple of ribs. While I was listening to this news, I stared at Jude where he sat on the couch. I'd never felt so much anger toward a child before. I hadn't imagined it was possible. But at the same time, I felt pity. His outward appearance and all the behavior I'd observed were at odds with the things he'd done. I'd tried to imagine him stabbing a dog, smashing a rabbit, and pushing my mother-in-law down the stairs. And I struggled to do it. 
It just didn't make sense to me. I jerked from my seat as the doorbell rang. I knew it was a social worker. I'd called the adoption agency as soon as they were open. And while I immediately started talking about dissolving the adoption, the woman on the phone talked me down and agreed to send someone out first thing to see what could be done about the situation. Reluctantly, I agreed. I opened the door to find a middle-aged woman with a plump face, dressed in a pantsuit. Her auburn hair framed her face and swayed as she bobbed her head. Hello, Mr. Romero, she said. I'm Terry Vargas. We shook hands and I showed her in. Hello, Jude, Terry Vargas said when we stepped into the living room. Jude turned and looked at her briefly before returning his gaze to the television. Have you been filled in? I whispered in the woman's ear. She nodded. I believe so. There have been incidents, but you can't prove he was responsible for all of them. Is that right? I scoffed. We can certainly prove that he pushed my mother-in-law down the stairs. I didn't think anyone saw it, she said. Isn't that right? Not even your mother-in-law. There was no one else in the house, I said, and she felt him push her. There's no other explanation. It certainly wasn't my wife or me who pushed her. Of course not, Vargas said. That's not what I mean. I just like to err on the side of caution when it comes to these things. These things? Does this happen a lot? No, poor choice of words, I'm sorry. But I would like a couple of hours alone with Jude, if you don't mind. I gestured at the boy. Please, I said. I'm going to pick my wife up from the hospital and maybe get something to eat, if she even has an appetite after the night we've had. We'll be back to discuss options with you in two hours. Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Romero. As I went out to the garage, I thought I heard a thump from upstairs. I paused and looked up, wondering what could have caused the noise. Then I shook my head and shrugged it off, thinking it was a byproduct of my stress and exhaustion. 20 minutes later, Alina and I were sitting in the car in the hospital parking lot. I'd gone inside to see Jeannie, but she was unconscious and needed to sleep after being in surgery. So Alina and I left and I filled her in on what had happened with the social worker. It was only then that I realized I hadn't even told her I was planning on calling the adoption agency. I want to go home, she said, glaring at me. Now, Alina, you can't seriously want to keep him. He pushed your mother down the stairs. You talk about him like he's a dog or something, she said. I don't know what I want, but I'm not ready to give up on him. He's just a child. We can help him, baby. Take me home. Realizing I wouldn't convince her of anything, I started the car and headed back to the house. By the time we got back, it had only been about 40 minutes since I'd left. The garage door was still open. I had forgotten to close it when I left. So I pulled in and we got out without a word. We moved into the house through the laundry room. It was quiet. I heard no talking and no television. And then there was a sudden, piercing cry from the living room. Alina and I rushed into the room to see Jude in the corner, hugging his legs to his chest, hands bloody. On the floor nearby between the couch and the coffee table was Terry Vargas. She was lying on the floor, shirt and suit jacket drenched in blood with knife wounds all over her body. And sitting on his knees next to her was the teenage boy who'd come to the house to tell me he'd seen Jude shortly after the dog was killed on the green belt. His hands were covered in blood and he was looking up at us with a shocked expression on his face. There was a bloody knife sitting on the carpet nearby. Jude was screaming. He killed her! Repeatedly. Alina screamed at the sight of the dead woman and she rushed toward Jude to protect him. The teenager jumped to his feet and ran toward the back door. After a moment of shock, I ran after him. He made a beeline directly for the damaged part of the back fence, the same place I'd managed to fit through on the day the dog was killed. But as he tried to squirm through the opening, I caught his legs and yanked him back into the yard. He whipped a fist at me, striking me in the side of the head. He managed to get one of his legs free and kicked me in the chest. I fell back, but quickly recovered, lunging toward him. Abandoning the fence exit, he squirmed from my grasp and ran back toward the house. And I immediately saw what he was heading for. The shovel was propped up on the wall under the patio. Scrambling up to my feet, 
I sprinted toward him, hoping to get there before he reached the shovel. But I didn't. He grabbed it and swung it at me. I ducked back and the spade flashed through the air an inch from my face. As he moved to swing it back the other way, I rushed him, bringing up an arm to protect my head as the wood handle hit me. It was a weak hit and I slammed him back into the side of the house. I punched him once in the face and then wrenched the shovel away from him, jamming the handle up against his throat to keep him there. Call the police! I shouted to Alina. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the kid said. But I didn't do it, I didn't do it! Who are you? I asked, puzzle pieces starting to take shape in my mind. I'm Jude's brother, he said, half choking. I moved the shovel down and put it against his upper chest instead of his throat. His brother? The one who ran away? The kid nodded. Yeah, but, so you're the one who's been doing all this. Why? Are you trying to ruin your brother's life? What's wrong with you? I didn't do it. I didn't do any of it, he said whining and sniveling. I didn't believe a word he said. He'd just tried to kill me after all. As I thought about it, it all made sense to me. The kid was trying to make his brother as miserable as he was. Their father had really done a number on him, but I realized my wife was right to second guess what we were seeing. Jude was innocent. He was the sweet kid we thought he was. But then I remembered Jeannie being pushed down the stairs. How would he have done that? Suddenly, the strange noises I'd been hearing in the house came to mind. Have you been living in my attic? The kid paused, looking at me through teary eyes. I can just go up and look for myself. I'm sure you've left some evidence. Okay, he said. Yes, I have been, but it's not what you think. Yeah, right, I said. There were two different attic access panels in the house. He could have easily slipped out and pushed Jeannie down the stairs, then let us think it was Jude. You told him not to tell, didn't you? I asked. Jude knew you were here the whole time, but you convinced him not to tell us. No, he cried. Just listen to me, please, just listen. Against my better judgment, I listened to his story. It was the story of a guilty teenager who'd been caught red-handed and was grasping at straws so he wouldn't spend his life in prison. And I didn't believe a word of it. The first responders arrived not long after and arrested the kid. The woman was dead. There was nothing they could do for her. But they checked over Jude for wounds. He'd been bloody when we found him, but they found no wounds on him. The police interviewed all of us, including Jude, who talked more in one sitting than I'd ever heard before. He told the detectives that his brother, Aiden, had come from upstairs and stabbed the woman repeatedly and then tried to force the bloody knife into Jude's hands. Jude had just dropped the knife and moved away from his brother when my wife and I came into the room. He also said that his brother had come into his room and hid under the bed just after Jeannie fell down the stairs. Jude had walked out to see what happened, which was when we saw him at the top of the stairs. And why didn't you say anything about your brother being in the house? The detective asked. Jude cast his eyes down. He said he'd hurt them if I told anyone. Sobbing, Alina hugged him to her chest. We left the house soon afterward, heading to a hotel for the night. The place was a crime scene, and the detective said they would likely have people there for much of the day and into the night. But before we left, I got into the attic and found a skateboard, a sleeping bag, a backpack, and a grocery bag of food trash. I made sure to tell the police about it. At the hotel, we had room service and watched a movie. Jude seemed to be opening up a little bit more. I guessed that the stress of having his brother around all that time had made him closed off. It was nice to see him opening up to us. At bedtime, Alina and I slept in one of the beds and Jude in the other. In the dark room, I found myself staring up at the ceiling, thinking about the story Aiden had told me before he'd been arrested. He said that Jude was dangerous. He said that the only reason he was hanging around was to protect me and Alina. When he came to the house to tell us about the dog, he was hoping it would be enough to make us get rid of Jude. He couldn't just come out and say Jude was dangerous. He knew we'd never believe him. So he was waiting, biding his time until he could give us the evidence we needed to see Jude for what he really was. He even said that it wasn't his father who had abused him he said it was Jude. 
He said he would wake up to Jude hitting him with a baseball bat in the middle of the night, and that the bruises they'd found on Jude's body when the social workers had first gotten involved were self-defense wounds from Aiden himself. They'd blamed the father, but it was really Jude's doing. It was all Jude. When Aiden realized he would be put into foster care with his brother, he knew it wouldn't be long before Jude actually tried to kill him, so he ran away. He said that Jude was the one who'd stabbed the woman to death and that Aiden had been trying to help her when we came in. And he'd only attacked me with a shovel because he panicked, knowing we wouldn't believe him. I went over his story in my mind, thinking it through. Something about the dark of night made me consider it more than I had when Aiden first told me. The more I thought about it, the more I thought it might be the truth. I sat up in bed and looked over toward my adopted son. He was sitting up in bed his back perfectly straight, but his head turned toward me. He smiled in the darkness. Good night, Daddy. Sleep tight. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.